Okay, so uh, last class, last class we uh, did some intro stuff. We got to, oh, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 minutes of physics and then took five days off. Um, so I kind of feel like we need to hit reset a little bit, especially um, we've had some new additions to the class. I found a button in CoLab where I was able to add the whole wait list to the class. And until the seats are all full, I guess I'll keep hitting that button. Um, I think we're up to like 246 people in this class. So um, here's a quick review of what we talked about last class. What we talked about is that pretty much I think as long as there have been humans, we've been asking this question, how do things work? That is a worthwhile question to ask. And there's lots of ways you can answer that question. There's lots of ways you can attack that question. I think we humans have been attacking that question for a long time. And that's an important question to ask. It does, it kind of gives your life some meaning to ask that question. I hope everyone in some way or another asks that question. I hope you walk around the world and go, huh, why am I not falling through the floor? That's a good question to ask. We always want to know how does thing, how does, how does, how do things work? How does the world around us work? Uh, humans made sporadic progress in that question for the first, I don't know, 50,000 years or so of our existence. Uh, last class we mentioned a little shout out to Democritus, a little shout out to Greek philosophy. The idea of atomic theory comes from Greek philosophy. A, Tom means not cut. And the idea that maybe everything's made of little bits, that's a great idea. That, that theory actually got us a couple millennia. I don't know, the last few weeks physics has been questioning that. We'll get to that. Um, I actually did mention um, a couple papers. And the main, the main reason I brought these two papers up, the first one is Newton's publication 1686. The second one is a uh, paper that came out in 2012, both asking the question, how does the world work? And the main reason I want to bring those up is to sh demonstrate we're still wondering that question. Humans have been asking that question a long time. We're still asking that question. We've actually ha made some pretty impressive progress. Good job us, we're figuring some things out. But pretty much every time we figure something out, there's about 10 more questions that are unveiled. Um, and this paper that came out in 2012 is a good example of that. We figured some stuff out. We si figured some stuff out that specifically that other paper, the, 18, the 1686 paper, was asking. We actually figured some stuff out. So if Newton was still around, he'd be like, thanks guys, it took you 400 years, but that is a big, weight off my shoulders. Um, but it, it opened up a whole new, really a realm of physics. So if anyone here is thinking about switching to physics as a major, there's a lot of stuff out there to study. Uh, if you're a philosophy major or an art major, you can actually kind of go right into physics. It's not even that crazy of a jump. You just walk across the street and they'll let you into the theoretical physics department, learn a little bit of math, and you're there. Um, so that's the kind of where we are right now. Uh, and then from that, I, I did, I also, another reason I wanted to mention Newton last week is in this long human history of trying to figure out how stuff works, I think Newton is a good entry point for us. I think it's a good place to start and say, hmm, here's a guy that actually figured out some laws of how stuff works. He actually figured out some laws, and he wrote them down in that publication right there, and he said, guys, I think I figured out at least three, we call them Newton's three laws of motion, and that's a good place for us to start, because in this class, a lot of what we're going to be concerned about rests on a good understanding of, of Newton's law. So we're going to go almost painfully slow into Newton's laws just so we all feel good about that and what those laws kind of tell us about the world around us, and then we can get into some cooler stuff. But um, not that that's not cool stuff. So that's where, we're, that's where we are right now. We're just starting into Newton's laws. Last class, we got into the first half of the first law, I would say. So last class I described Newton's law as saying stuff is hard to shake. And by shake what I mean is when I take an object, it's at rest, it wants to stay that way. It's not moving, it's not going anywhere. That's its preferred state. It wants to just stay there because that's how it is right now. Shaking it requires me to do two things. I gotta get it going. That's the first half. This, uh, this basketball right now at rest doesn't want to do that. There's something about its actual nature that doesn't want me to get it going. And once I do get it going, that's not shaking yet. I have to slow it down and stop it and then make it go 
go the other way. And that process is kind of two things. It's taking something stationary, getting it going, and then once it's going, bringing it to a stop again. Those two things are kind of wrapped up in Newton's first law when he says stuff is hard to shake. And like I said last class, that's actually a pretty profound statement. It doesn't sound too profound to say stuff is hard to shake, but especially in 1686 to say, you know what? There is something inherent about this ball right now that makes it hard to shake. This bowling ball is definitely hard to shake, but what's dif what's, what makes this ball, bowling ball difficult to shake is not its weight. And Newton had never been to space. No one in Newton's time had ever been to space. So the idea of floating around in space is a pretty difficult thought experiment when you're living in the 17th century. And so if you're living in the 17th century and someone says, well, just imagine you're an astronaut, that's going to be tough. Now, I, I've, none of us, I don't think, well, I've never been to space, but at least I've seen enough YouTube videos of guys floating around. I can kind of get an idea what it would be like. And if, say I was floating around space, it looks something like this, then this bowling ball would still be hard to shake. And that claim that Newton says, you know, it has nothing to do with the Earth. If the Earth were to disappear right now, this bowling ball would still be really hard to shake. This difficulty that I'm experiencing right now has nothing to do with the fact that I'm on Earth, has nothing to do with this thing called gravity that we'll get into, it has nothing to do with, I don't know, air resistance or what this is made of. It's just an inherent property of the actual atoms in here that make it hard to do this. If I was floating around in space, and then I were to headbutt this thing, it would still hurt. That's not just because, so Earth isn't necessary for that to hurt. If I were to headbutt a bowling ball in space, it wouldn't just go like rocketing away from my forehead at speed of light. It would want to stay put. Okay. So that's kind of the first half of Newton's law, is the fact that stuff wants to stay put if it's not going anywhere. And then this, today we're going to talk about the second half, which is once it's going, it wants to stay that way. But before we get uh, too much down that road. Last class, we also talked about some logistics. It's probably worth mentioning them again. Let's see. Um, I'll just say it like maybe one more time. I won't say it again. Uh, I know all of your snow photos are just blowing up on Instagram right now, and your phone's just like, hey, somebody else like that. If you've never gone 50 minutes without your phone or your laptop in your life, maybe this class would be that time you try it not a requirement. If you just can't do it, you know, seek help, I guess. But uh, I think you could get by in this class without technology. I think you could. So um, what I mentioned last class that I think is important to know is that I don't, no, on the midterm, I'm not going to ask you what was the date of publication. How do you spell Newton? What was his first name? There's no factual things. I can't think of any that are going to be on any test or anything. Like that. I really want you to be trying to understand what we're talking about conceptually. And I think the way I, and I doubt all 246 of you think like just like me, the way I think is I, I, I need to be kind of my eyes up and trying to engage and maybe even asking questions every now and then you're allowed to do that. Um, so that might be a good way to learn. If you need to have your laptop, I'm going to do that. Uh, that's fine. Just know that the person behind you is also distracted by Instagram or whatever you're on. So uh, there it is. That's the last pitch. Um, do what you need to do. OK, uh, let's see. Eye clickers. I'll probably give grace for a couple days so we all get that thing figured out. You need to get one or use the app. If you get the smartphone app, one thing I realized after last class, um, my attendance was um, unknown. Unknown iClicker user one, unknown iClicker user two. So I had like 80 people that were, that was their name uh, last class. I don't know who you are. You have to go into like settings and uh, your UVA ID, use your mail ID. Like I'm MWS6U, use your computing ID for your ID. Not some other one that some people use. Like don't use your student ID, don't, not, not the one on your actual ID. Use your mail ID for your iClicker if you're using the app. I think that'll work. So bring your iClickers, use them. If you didn't have one last class, you don't have one today, it's fine. We'll, we'll wait a couple classes till they really count. Um, turns out, I think if you buy the Wiley Plus Access, you get a digital copy of the textbook. Yeah, that's good. So you can use that. That would be nice. And let's see what else. Homework. Uh, yeah, the homework, a lot of people didn't have Wiley Access till yesterday or today. That's fine. The first couple homeworks. 
still have to do them, but I'm not going to count them late. If you get that, that one that was due last Friday, if you're too busy sledding, just get in like today-ish, I think would be a good deadline for that. And then again, last thing I think I need to tell you about me is that I'm always going to be running in and out of here, so I apologize for that. Um, if you need to ask me questions, I'm trying to be pretty good about email. Yeah, it might take me a day or two, but I'm trying to be pretty good about email. Um, and I'm going to have office hours starting maybe this week. Okay, I think that's all we need to know. Any questions before we get started? I did mention last class that um, everyone in here is smart, so if you have a question, that's probably a smart question. And someone else is probably thinking it too. So if you just, what's gravity again? We can talk about that. Or totally off the wall, how, what's the physics behind snow plows? We can talk about that. Um, so please ask questions. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Let, I think I want to do an eye closure question. Let me put this over here. One minute, I think. So 45 more seconds. To vote. Okay, we've got uh, Dr. Hawking is here. Okay, good. Two of them. more second. This is your attendance, but it's not going to count for another couple days. But you do want to vote. All right. Uh, there we are. You guys are smart. I think you're probably right. Most of you said, what was the number? I just covered up the answer. A was the top string. Most people think the top string. That's a smart answer. Let's see if that's correct. So here I am right here. Okay. So, I did say yank. Let's see if I can get if I can yank it. Um, I, oh, by the way, I did not let go. I broke the string. The bottom one broke. I, can you, there it is. So, I, I, I did just break the string. Hmm. 18 of you got that. Let's see. I don't know if there's enough string. I might try to get, eh, I don't think there's enough on here for me to do it again. Nope, there's not. Uh, oh, wait, there's another string. Let's try it again. So I, I, I feel bad for the 125 that said the other one. So let me, let me try it again. actually a lot of sense. If you said the top string, that's a great guess. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, just sitting here right now, you can tell that string already, this is um, one kilogram, so that's 2.2 pounds. That's a, that's a pretty heavy weight right there, and this is not, this is, this is not that strong a string. I've broken two of them already. So 
it's already under a lot of stress, a lot of tension right now, so that's a pretty good guess that that would break. All I'd have to do is add a little bit. Oh, here, well, I'll just make you guys feel better. Here, I'll break the top one now. There. Okay. So I broke the top one. So you were right if you guessed one A or B, I guess. So I was able to break the top one. But I do want to think about why I was able to pick, because I was able to pick. Again, here I'm being a magician. But I was able to pick which one I broke. I picked the other one just to make the, the other 11 or 18 people feel good. Um, and here's how I was able to pick. This is a lot of weight. This is a lot of weight. So the top string was under a lot of tension. That top string was about ready to break. If I were to give that top string much more tension, it actually would have broken like it did just now. But stuff is hard to shake. This kilogram, whatever this is, maybe steel. I think this is steel. Is this iron? I think it's iron. This kilogram right here is a lot of stuff. Stuff is hard to shake. That stuff, and here's how I think we could all picture this. This might be helpful. Is anchored in space. Last class I mentioned the iron atoms in here are actually manifestations in a medium that you and I take for granted called space. Physicists now think of this thing, this stuff right here, not the air stuff, if you take the air out, this thing, space, as a medium. And if you're in that space like you and I are right now, you're a manifestation in a medium. And you can't just go zipping around at the speed of light, unless you're a photon or a couple other things. But for the most part, you don't go zipping around at the speed of light. You are difficult to shake. You're kind of anchored. You're in it. And so this thing is in space, and it wants to stay that way. It's an object at rest. It wants to stay at rest. So I come along and give a good, strong yank to that bottom string, and the bottom string starts to stretch. And this thing is just like big and heavy. doesn't want to go anywhere. And it doesn't. It basically is anchored, and I can pull on that string. I can give it a good, strong yank, and it really doesn't go anywhere. It starts to go somewhere, but that's a time-intensive process. And by the time it really goes anywhere at all, that string is broken, and there's no more stress on it. So I was able to break the bottom string by taking advantage of Newton's first law that this thing is at rest and wants to stay away, stay that way. The Latin word we talked about last class, inertia, means lazy, inert, inert gas, doesn't want to react. This thing's lazy. It wants to stay put. The phrase I always put in my head, I don't know if it helps you, it's an inertial, an inertial anchor. You can actually sort of anchor yourself in space just by being massive. So when I'm an astronaut floating around outside of the space station or outside the space shuttle, that space shuttle is, well... Let's just pretend for today it's just floating also. It's very heavy, so I can give my little tether a yank, and I, the space shuttle serves as an inertial anchor. I'm kind of anchored to something very big. Both the space shuttle and I aren't actually physically tied to either to anything, but it's sort of my inertial anchor. It's, it's really stuck in space. I can give it a yank, and I go floating back to the space station, even though it's just floating around, sort of. Okay, so... This thing was stuck. I was able to pull on it. It didn't really want to go anywhere. Then the second time, to make everyone feel better, I pulled slowly. And when I pulled slowly, I gave this thing time to get going. And as I s slowly pulled, and it was had time to get going, it started moving. And that top string definitely had more stress than the bottom one, because it had the weight of this in it. And it, that's the one that gave way. Any questions about that? Okay. So that right there is an example. Okay. That right there is an example of an object at rest that wants to stay at rest. That's the first half of Newton's law. The second half of shaking something is an object in motion that wants to stay in motion. Let's see. That is. If I were to, if I were to ask for a a day to have a big dump of snow, it would be the day we talk about an object in motion that tends to stay in motion. That's been, I think, my experience the last couple days. Uh, yesterday, like an idiot, I was driving my car, and I'm driving down the street. I and my car are an object in motion. We want to stay in motion. I turn the steering wheel, 
to the right, and my car keeps going straight, because that's what it does. Maybe a little caveat to this, an object in motion wants to stay in motion, should be in the direction it's going. And so my car is in a, in traveling in a line that away, and I turn the steering wheel, it wants to keep going that away. Or if you're walking down the street, and you're, or maybe, yeah, I mean, I'm sure everyone's experienced something like this. You're walking down the street, you would like to stop, and it's a little hard to stop if you don't have the asphalt below you to help out. Or, I guess, an object at rest, maybe you are standing and you decide, I'm going to start walking now. And if you've I ice under your shoes, and I've been like an idiot wearing um, leather sold shoes last couple days, uh, that also doesn't really help. So I am an object at rest. It takes a while for me to get going. And once I'm going, it takes me for a while to get stopped. And so that right there, again, is a property of matter. And again, something I want to uh, emphasize that is important about that claim is, first of all, it's, it's universal. And again, that's why Newton got famous for saying this. For when Newton, if, if Newton were to, Newton came along and said, if he were to come along and say, hey guys, I, I figured out some stuff, not really sure what, I got a list, just a few things, likes to keep in motion once it's in motion. That wouldn't be that impressive. He comes along with a universal law. He says that everything, if it's made of stuff, and that's everything, if it's in motion, it wants to stay in motion. So first of all, it's profound and controversial because it's universal. He says, that's it, everything. Me, you, oceans, air, cocker spaniels, planets, everything in motion wants to stay in motion. That's I think a pretty profound statement. Here's another thing that is important about that statement. Here's another thing that's important about that statement, is that it's not only is it universal, the other thing, my, my camera, I was playing with my camera, I already lost it. Um, I'll figure it out, I'll remember later. So anyway, so here's, here's Newton comes along and says that that's everything it tends to stay in motion. And here's what I think is a little bit crazy about that. He had never seen anything in motion stay in motion forever. So that's one of the things that he can, I think, is an impressive statement. For it to come along and you're writing, you're, publicizing, you're, you're publishing this paper, and you say, guess what, guys? If you're in motion, you'll tend to stay that way forever. It's pretty easy to, to refute that. You could say, well, show me something that you've ever seen that has just stayed in motion forever. We're, that's not our typical experience. Our typical experience is, I start walking, I'll eventually stop. I push something, I push something on uh, this table, it comes to a stop. Push something else, it comes to a stop. If I, were, if I wanted to maybe write a universal law in 1686, it would be this. Everything eventually stops. That would kind of be in line with everyone's experience. But really what Newton is saying is anything you've ever seen going stop, something stopped it. Something came along, something external to it. Given its own devices, completely on its own, it would have gone forever. And that's kind of crazy to think about. So, I mean, just imagine you just take a baseball and just throw it. And you just watch it go in a straight line forever. That's the universe Newton's talking about. It's crazy, but that's how the baseball would act, out, neglecting any other outside influences. So if there were no other influences on that baseball, just take it and go, boop, and it would just shoot off in a straight line at a constant velocity forever. Now, we don't normally see things like that, but like I keep saying, if now that we have astronauts and stuff, we have at least a little more access to that kind of situation. And so, I don't know, I don't think too many astronauts have done that, but if you've seen Gravity or so, I don't know, some sci-fi movie where you know, somebody comes untethered from their spaceship and off they go, straight line forever, and that's what they do. And there's nothing they can do about that. They're going in a straight line forever until they maybe throw something that way. But uh, an object in motion is going to tend to stay in motion unless you push off something else like, I don't know, rocket fuel or something like that. Okay, so that's pretty much Newton's first law. Oh, by the way, so... Uh, and nowadays, you know, it's the 21st century, we have these little hockey pucks. They will kind of kind of go in a straight line forever. Yeah. So, I, yeah, that's pretty good. So that will kind of go in a straight line forever until it experiences some outside force. Okay. So, unfortunately, Newton did not have access to the Air Pro hockey puck. That would have made his argument a little bit easier, but figured it out anyway, so I think that's why we should be kind of impressed. This guy figured all this out. Okay.
enough of Newton's first law. Any questions? Today I want to talk a little bit about Newton's second law. There's only three. It won't take that long to get all of them down. Well, it's kind of four. We might get into four. Newton's second law. Okay, first law, stuff is hard to shake, often phrased the way I just pulled it up, an object in motion, an object rests and stay at rest, object in motion and stay in motion. You may have heard that before. If you've heard that before, it might just in over your head or in one ear out the other. Take a second, actually believe that. That that is an inherent property of matter. If you are moving, you're gonna stay that way. Outside without any other outside forces. If you're at rest, you're gonna stay that way forever. That seems to be actually how the world works. He figured that out, and we really haven't challenged that much in the 350 years since. Okay. He got famous for another one. More stuff, harder to shake. So this guy's getting famous for some very profound statements. More stuff, harder to shake. Let's see. And I think, so if we were to have only, I think if we were to try to think of the terminology that we really need to get solid in this class. I think we're up to one term, and that's inertia or mass or shakeability. I'll use those interchangeably. So, yeah, I don't think I ever, I don't think I mentioned the word mass. I should mention that. That's what we call mass, by the way. So, if something is massive, it has this thing called inertia. So, the mass of this thing is one kilogram. And the reason I like to imagine floating out in space sometimes is because the mass of this here on Earth is one kilogram. Guess what its mass is in space? One kilogram. That is a measure of its stuff. Now, if I were to put this on a bathroom scale here on Earth, it would measure about 2.2 pounds. And if I were to float around in space with a bathroom scale, it would weigh nothing. And so weight, we haven't really gotten into yet, weight can be misleading. So I like to think of mass. That's just literally a measure of the stuff. And this is massive, and I can tell it's massive because it's hard to shake. If I were to just try to weigh it, that just depends on what planet I'm on. If I'm on Earth, it weighs 2.2 pounds. I go to the moon, it weighs less. I go to Jupiter, it weighs more. But if I try to shake something, this feels just like it would if I was floating around in space. So that's mass. That's our maybe one term so far. Mass, inertia, shakeability, or stuff. Those are all kind of interchangeable. Stuff, shakeability, mass, or inertia. Let's have one more term, I guess, and that'll be probably it for a day, of, of at least in terms of terminology, and that is force. And that is part of Newton's second law. Here's what, here's what Newton said about force. If you want to get something going, you have to push on it. And the more massive it is, the harder you're going to have to push to get it going. I think I can give us an equation. I'm, I'm going I'm to try my hardest to stay away from math in this class. So let's not call this an equation. Let's call this a relationship. Here's a relationship that I think is worth knowing. There's a relationship between how hard you push on something, how massive it is, and how quickly it gets going. That's what that relationship that I just put up right there says. And here's and I'm not just I'm not just playing semantics when I call that a relationship. That really that's how we I think we should think of it because there's a relationship between these three properties or these three quantities. So I have an object here it's got a certain mass, a kilogram. And that, I like to think of as, that is sort of the resistance or reluctance to being accelerated or to get going or to stop going if it's already going. That's what, the, that's what that equation is, that, or relationship is telling us, is that there's a certain reluctance or inertness to getting going. And so the more massive something is, harder I'm going to have to push on it or pull to get it going. And so uh, I already said that I think interchangeable would be mass, stuff, inertia, shakeability. Also interchangeable would be force, push, and pull. 
think those are all the synonyms I have for force. So if I want to get something going, and that's the A part, which we'll have to talk about. If I want to get something going, here's what Nina's saying. There's one way to do it, and you push on it. And again, uh, I think some of, the, some of these terms, there's a tendency to go, yeah, duh, I get that. But I think that's, it's important to stop and, and really process what Newton is claiming with that relationship. What Newton is saying is that that's the only way. The only way, if you've ever seen anything in this universe get going, or if you've seen anything in this universe stop going, it was undergoing a push or a pull or a force. They, things in this universe do not do that on their own. And so just these two laws, we can look at situations, and that's what this class is going to be largely about, trying to figure out how stuff works. I can look at something how, and, try, and ask how it works, and I can draw conclusions. I can look at it and say, it started moving. There must have been a force. Sometimes that force is not apparent, but because I watched it get going, I can draw a very sound conclusion. There was a force. And so when, when Newton watches an apple that was at rest fall from the tree, Newton can say, something did that. That is not just the apple exert, like exhibiting its appleness. That was, there was actually something there that made it do that. And then I can start maybe investigating, what the heck was it? Why did that do that? What force, what push or pull acted on it? And again, the rate at which that happens is the mass of the thing. And so if I give something a push and it has little mass, if it's not so massive, it's A, acceleration, rate of change of velocity, which we'll get into, will be high. And that's why I like this relationship. You can, if you're not a math major, I think you can divide by m and say that a equals f over m, right? a equals f over m. So a being acceleration, just the rate at which it gets going or comes to a stop, is determined by how much push the f, but also sort of mediated or controlled or dampened by the mass of the thing. So if I want to get something going, I need to give it a push, but that push will sort of be impeded by how massive the thing is. Okay, we're going to use Newton's second law to look a little more carefully at the weight deal I had up here earlier, and I'm going to draw pictures. I think I'm going to do it. Okay, here's my weight right here. Here's that the mass, just the object I have hanging from a string. And I want to. I would like to understand how I was able to break one string or the other. I was able to select which string. And so here's this weight. And here's what Newton is saying. Newton is saying this object is going to stay at rest unless there is no force acting on the thing. If there is a force acting on it, it's going to accelerate. It's going to change its state. So this thing's at rest, and it's staying there. So there must be no forces acting on it, or Here's maybe the, an, um, another important word for us to know. There's no net force acting on it. Net meaning total or sum or cumulative force. So here's an object that has some forces acting on it, but they must all cancel out. They must all cancel out because it's at rest. So here's an object at rest, and it's staying that way. And the only way it's staying that way is if there's no net forces acting on it. Well, I know there's at least one force because right before I hung it on the string, I, I felt it in my hand, and it had a force downward called weight. It was being pulled down. So if that was the only force on the object, according to Newton, it would accelerate in that direction. A equals F over M. It would accelerate, meaning get going. We're going to be more specific about acceleration detailed about what that means, but for now, accelerate means get going. And so if that was the only force on the thing, it would accelerate. It would get going in that direction. But because it's not, something was canceling it out, and that is what I'll call tension or the force from the string. So I've got weight pulling down, I've got string pulling up, and those cancel out. So like I said, Newton's laws enable us to draw some conclusions about the situation. So this is a pretty simple situation. The 
weight hanging from a string. But I can look at that and start drawing some, some really sound, physically valid conclusions about it. It's not getting going anywhere. It's not accelerating. So there must be no force or net force. And so I might conclude, well, there's no forces on it. That's one valid conclusion. Or I can say there's no net or total forces, meaning they all cancel out. One down, one up, they must cancel out. Okay. So I can actually look at this thing and see that the force in the top string is equal to the weight pulling down. These two forces are equal and opposite. They cancel out. There's no net force. Now, when I come along and I start pulling more on here, so there's not just the weight, but here's me. When I pull slowly, if this thing isn't going to really go anywhere, it's just almost it's hardly moving, this top string has to balance the weight of the thing, but also me. And that's how I was able to break the top string. I was able to break the top string by pulling down slowly, and my weight, my pull, my, my force, was added to the weight pulling down, and the string on top had to do both. It had to resist me and the weight. And eventually, I was able to get it to break by adding more and more and more and more. Now, if I want to just snap the top string, I can do the exact same thing. But here's where the inertia of this comes into play. This thing's massive. It wants to, in order for it to accelerate, big M. Okay. Big mass. So that thing has a big mass. It's very massive. And so if I were to if I were to pull very quickly, it needs to get going quick to go with me. But it can't because it's so massive. And so it's not going to get going very quickly. Its acceleration just is finite because it's stuck there because of its mass. And so when I pull quickly, it can't get going that quickly. And so by the time it's gotten going, I've already snapped the bottom string. So I can, use, I can use Newton's first two laws to really understand that situation. That I can actually, this thing can't get going that quickly because it's so massive. Cool. Any questions? Good. We have time to, let's introduce Newton's third law. And we'll call it a day in like six minutes. Okay. One more example of Newton's first law of force. I've got this basketball up here. I, wanted to mention, I just did want to mention this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, real quick about Newton's first law, then we're going to get to Newton's third law, because it has to do with snow and ice and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, one thing I just did want to, another example I wanted to mention is that this basketball at rest wants to stay that way. And when I throw it in there, and the main reason I want to mention this is because it's a common misconception. When I throw this into the air, after it leaves my hand, I'm not touching it anymore. Think for a second, what is continuing to propel the basketball up into the air? Right now it's in my hand. I'm going to give it a toss, but it's going to leave my hand. And a moment after it leaves my hand, it's just, it's still moving up. It's being kind of, seems to be like propelled or yeah, shot up into the air. So after it leaves my hand, think about what is causing it to continue to go up into the air, sort of propelling it up up really hot. And a lot of people want to say, oh, well, it's you. You're propelling it. You're pushing on it. But after, I mean, I, after it leaves my hand, I'm not in contact with it anymore. And so we need to believe that I have no influence on this thing after it leaves my hand. If I'm not touching it, I, I'm not propelling it or anything. And it's actually just, I've gotten this object in motion, and as soon as it leaves my hand, it wants to stay that way. And so as soon as it leaves my hand, its own inertia its own mass is what takes it up into the air. So all I have to do is give it a little little boost, a little impulse, and then its own inertia is what takes it up into the air. And if I were out in space, it would just shoot off forever in a straight line and never come back. I could just go like, Poof, and then it would never come back. It would just go straight forever. There is one other force acting on it that eventually accelerates it in the opposite direction. That's its own weight. And so... I give it a little impulse, it goes up, its, its own inertia takes it up, and then its own weight slows it to a stop and accelerates it back down. Any questions? Okay, 
Let me just mention uh, Newton's third law. I want to get this out of here in like five minutes. Let me just men mention Newton's third law. It has to do with how we're going to get home. We're going to walk home on snow and ice, and then we'll, we'll, we'll investigate it a little more next class. Here's Newton's third law. Stuff, matter, it pushes back. And so here's back to what I was saying that uh, has been an issue, uh, I think, for a lot of us the last couple days. We walk around on snow and ice. That if I'm at rest and my physics classroom is down there, I would like to get from here to there and not be late. I can't push or pull on myself to get there. You can try, but you really can't push on yourself. And so if I want to get from here to there, I need to, I need to, I'm at rest, I need to accelerate. A equals F over M. I have some M, I would like to A, I need some F that way. And so my physics class is that way. And who do I get to push on me? I could wait until someone gives me a shove and off I go. So if you've ever been snowboarding, sometimes that's what you do, is wait for somebody to come along and give you a push. But I, but, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm late enough, there's no one else coming, I'm standing there. Here's what I do. I push on the only thing of, that I'm touching right now, and that's the floor. I push on the floor, and the floor pushes me back. That is actually, again, a big misconception, something that, like a lot of people miss out on in, when, they, when they take physics, is that always is true. You've never pushed on anything and had it not push you back. It is always, always, always true. So if you want a push, all you have to do is push on something else. It will push you back. It's always going to be true. So here I am standing on ice. I would like to get into the physics building. I'm outside in the middle of McCormick Road or something. I would like to get in there. I don't have a lot of push available because it's slippery, but I'm going to give a little push to the ice before I start slipping, and it's going to push me back. It's always going to push me back, and I'll accelerate. A equals F over M. I won't accelerate much because because of the ice, I only get a little F, and I've got 170 pounds of M, so it's going to be little, and it's going to take me a while to get where I'm going, but I am going to accelerate this way. But the way I'm going to do it is take advantage of Newton's third law stuff always pushes back. And so next time you are walking anywhere or driving anywhere, think, my car did not push itself down the road. What pushed my car? Not the engine, not the gasoline. My car struck a deal with the ground. The car said, I'm going to push the ground this way and I'll go this way. That's what your car does all day long. Watch your tires. They go around. Sounds like overly simplistic, but you have, you have to think about it. Your tires go around, they push the street that way, the street pushes you back. Your tires go around, they push the street that way, and it pushes you back. It's a deal you strike all day long as you drive or walk or bike or skate or whatever you're doing. You're always pushing something that way to go that way. And when there's ice, the, uh, how hard you can push that way is limited, and so you only can get so much push. And so if you want to really get to class quickly, you need either more F, so you need to get chains on your tires or something like that, or ice skates or something, or reduce your mass. That's harder. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap up. See you Wednesday.